Good morning, counselors. We're live from River Valley, and I'll call the meeting to order in like 30 seconds. Good morning. Welcome to the Monday, February 27th, 2023 Community and Public Services meeting. It is 9.30 a.m. and I will call the meeting to order. At this time, I'd like to acknowledge that we meet on the, on the traditional land of Treaty 6 territory and acknowledge the diverse indigenous people whose ancestors have footsteps have marked this territory for centuries, such as Cree, Dene, Sotu, Blackfoot, Dakota Sioux, as well as Métis and Inuit, and now settlers from around the world. Let's begin with roll call of committee members. Councillor Nack. Good morning. Councillor Paquette. Good morning. Councillor Principe. Good morning. And Councillor Rice. Good morning. Good morning. And we committee also welcomes other other councillors joining today. Councillor Wright. Good morning. Councillor Stevenson. Good morning. Councillor Rutherford. Morning. Councillor Salvador. Good morning. I believe that's the only counselors I see. Are there any other counselors that I may have missed? Great, so I will now call for nominations of the Chair of Community and Public Services Committee. I can't click on, so. If I will nominate Councillor Principe. Thank you, Councillor Nack. Councillor Principe, do you accept the nomination? Yes, thank you. Thank you, Councillor Principe. Are there any other nominations? Seeing none, I declare nominations closed. Can I get a motion to appoint Councillor Principe as Chair of Community and Public Services Committee? So moved. Thank you, Councillor Knack. Please vote using eScribe that Councillor Principe be elected as Chair of Community and Public Services Committee. Well, I've got a spinning wheel, so I am a yes. Thank you, Councillor Paquette. We have four votes. We will now display the vote. And that has passed. Councillor Principe has been elected chair. I will now transfer the chair to Councillor Principe to conduct the election of vice chair. Thank you, Clerk Yusuf. I will now call for nominations for the vice chair of Community and Public Services Committee. Yes, Madam Chair, I would like to nominate Councillor Knack. Uh, thank Can you for the, oh, sorry. Thank you. Councillor Knack, do you accept the nomination? I do not. Thank you, though, for the nomination. I'll, I'll, I'm going to nominate oh. Councillor once the time comes. Well, there we go. All right. Are there any other nominations? I'll nominate Councillor Rice. <laughs> <laughs> okay. In case you... Uh... Councillor Rice, do you accept the nomination? Uh, yes. Are there any other nominations? Seeing none, I call nominations closed. Can I get a motion to appoint Councillor Rice's committee? So moved. Thank you. Please vote. We have four votes. Thank you. Please display the vote. And that has carried. Councillor Rice has been elected vice chair. Now we will proceed with the agenda. Can I ask someone to move adoption of the agenda, please? So moved. Thank you, please vote. We have all the votes. Please display the vote.
And that has carried. Councillor Knack, can I ask you to move approval of the minutes? I would love to move the approval of the February 7th, 2023 Community and Public Services Committee meeting minutes. Thank you. Please vote. We have all the votes. Please display the vote. And that has carried. And protocol items, we have no protocol items today. Now I will ask uh, members of committee to click on to select items for debate. So ma Madam Chair, I know I cannot click on, can you add my name? Councillor Rice, you get to go twice. Uh, thank you. I would like to select 7.1. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Knack. Uh, thank you. Uh, quick questions on 7.2, please. Great. So all items have been selected for debate, so uh, no need to vote on that. Uh, I don't recall any requests to speak, Madam Clerk. No. Okay. Thank you and no requests for specific time on agenda. No counselor inquiries and reports to be dealt with at a different meeting, none. Requests to reschedule reports, none. Unfinished business, none. So we're on to public reports 7.1, alcohol consumption at designated sites in parks. And do we have a presentation from administration? Okay, great, thank you, go ahead. Good morning. Today we are here with an information report related to the city's pilot project regarding alcohol consumption in designated picnic sites with certain, within certain parks. There is a significant amount of data that has been collected from four different data streams and we wanted to take a few minutes to frame the context of the information that is available for your consideration today. We have two individuals who will take us through the presentation, Roger Jevney, Branch Manager, Community Recreation and Culture, and Ryan Barkway, Branch Manager, Research, Engagement and Communications. With that, I will pass it over to the team. Thanks, Jim. So the discussion around alcohol in parks first came about in June 2019 when the Edmonton Youth Council presented to the Community Public Services Committee on the public consumption of alcohol in municipal parks. In 2021, City Council directed administration to conduct the first pilot project to permit alcohol consumption in select picnic sites. The results of the pilot were presented early in 2022 and focused on the information collected through enforcement and operations teams, as well as online survey results. During the discussion last year, City Council determined that additional information was required before making a decision on how this pilot should proceed. Specifically, administration was asked to further analyze best practices, conduct in-depth engagement and a thorough GBA plus analysis, while concurrently running a second and expanded pilot. We've completed the second pilot project and further analysis, and would like to take the opportunity to frame the context of the four different data streams that are available for your consideration today. First, we'd like to discuss the literature review that was conducted to investigate the implications and best practices associated with alcohol consumption in parks. There's very little research that's been conducted on the effects of drinking in parks specifically. There are limited studies that found that social cultural values and perceptions and lived experience of historically marginalized communities relative to alcohol consumption and exposure in public outdoor spaces. There's one public policy research paper from the University of Victoria in which the City of Victoria and their City Council have relied heavily on the considerations of a pilot project. We conducted jurisdictional, jurisdictional scans in 2021 and 2022 and we had phone interviews with several comparable cities. There have been an observable uptick in Canadian municipalities piloting and or debating alcohol consumption in parks. As such, there's limited accumulated data relative to trends and best practices. There was a fair amount of research on the harms to specific populations such as veterans or school-aged children that have to walk past liquor stores on their way to school. There is, however, a significant amount of research and literature available related to the harms associated with alcohol consumption more broadly. The data is clear and shows that the more alcohol that is consumed, the more harm is evident. This can be wide ranging and include harms to self and to others. Examples include several types of cancer, heart and liver disease, mental health, abuse and assault. In January, the Canadian Centre on Substance Abuse and Addiction released new guidelines on alcohol and health, which replaced the former low risk guidelines. 
The evidence-based guidelines identify that consuming no alcohol is the safest, but consuming one to two standard drinks per week will likely avoid the risk of health consequences. Beyond that, there are increased risks to health consequences. This is, a, this is a significant change from the previous guidelines, which indicated that 10 to 15 standard drinks per week were low risk and reflects the current understanding of the health impacts of alcohol consumption. Thanks, Roger. The next data set is the public opinion research, which was aimed at determining the opinions of the broader population. Opinions were gathered using telephone surveys with about 400 randomly selected samples to seek a statistically representative voice for all Edmontonians, online surveys, which had nearly 5,000 respondents to understand perspectives from different sub-segments of the public, and intercept surveys of about 700 park visitors to gather feedback while they were using the parks. Using the statistically representative telephone survey, it was found that 80% of Edmontonians agreed that drinking should be permitted in parks. The majority seemed to feel that the number of parks and picnic sites included in the pilot project was adequate, though there was a sizable group that feels the program could be expanded further. Administration did also did a deeper sub-segment analysis of the online survey results to understand opinions using diverse groups. The analysis shows support for future alcohol use in parks varies among different groups. For example, younger generations, people who identify as 2SLGBTQ+, or those with higher income are more likely than the average to support drinking in designated parks. Recent immigrants and those of non-Christian religions are less likely than the average to support drinking in parks. The lowest support across all subsegments was from the 300 respondents of non-Christian religions at 58%. So focused public engagement sought to have in-depth, high-quality conversations with as many equity-deserving groups as possible, following a GBA plus approach. Using this approach, administration was able to identify which voices are at the table and which ones are still missing. And we were better positioned to investigate why some people or groups of people are positioned to benefit from being allowed to consume alcohol in parks and why others' experiences are negative or harmful. This engagement was done through online workshops with healthcare and education experts, intercept surveys with people representing equity-deserving groups at targeted locations, and finally, in-depth interviews with equity-deserving groups and diverse stakeholders. The project team was challenged with low participation and response rates from individuals and groups we attempted to connect with. However, quality conversations were had with those who did participate. This engagement overall found there was less awareness and support for the program among equity-deserving groups compared to the broader public. Workshop and interviewee participants were far more critical of the initiative, citing health risks and negative impacts to youth as their primary concerns. Individuals representing a cross-section of identities noted that alcohol might complicate their feelings of safety and that being in public spaces can already be difficult, be a difficult experience for some with the added stress of how intoxicated people might perceive and interact with them. Alberta Health Services and Edmonton Public School Board participants raised concerns about the misalignment between promoting healthy lifestyles and the harms associated with alcohol as well as undesirable behaviors and activities around schools and children. And finally, we have information from the pilot projects that were implemented in 2021 and 2022. We've had the opportunity to assess the various implementation approaches and action. In general, we found that there were minimal impacts to the picnic sites that are designated for alcohol consumption, such as lit excess litter or property damage. There were limited public complaints about issues arising from the program, although several people expressed concerns about what might happen. There were limited incidents of public disorder across the two pilot project years. Two different approach enforcement approaches had been tried in the first year. A proactive enforcement patrols conducted a high number of were they, a high number of pardon me. There were proactive engage, enforcement patrols, and they did note a high number of infractions with people drinking outside of their designated areas. In the second year, a more reactive model was used, where park rangers responded to reported issues. There were fewer, fewer infractions identified, but incidents of disorder or reported issues did not escalate when the reactive model was used. Using a reactive model of enforcement allowed administration to implement a program using existing budgets that, wouldn't be, that will be sustainable into the future. When designating and implementing the pilot projects, administration implemented a number of the best practices and mitigation measures that were also identified through our research and engagement. 
These included limiting the number of designated picnic sites, ensuring there are, there are alcohol-free parks and alcohol-free picnic sites available, providing ongoing review of the program and maintaining the ability to remove problematic sites from the program, carefully considering which sites are selected, including setbacks from playgrounds or other children amenities, and proximity to washrooms, visibility and accessibility of the picnic sites. In 2021, we expanded inspection and enforcement activities associated with the pilot, and this was not included in the 2022 pilot as directed by City Council, and we experienced very few issues in 2022 with not having the proactive enforcement. Many other suggested practices have been identified to help mitigate concerns. Some of these measures are complex and will require additional funding that's not currently allocated and may not be feasible. Examples include establishing limits on the program, such as adding meal requirements, possession limits, or removing glass containers. Such limits may also require additional enforcement and communication in order to implement. Conducting educational campaigns related to the effects of alcohol consumption. Administration would not be able to implement, administration would be able to implement communication plans. However, we're not experts on public health information and education, and this would need to be led by another organization. And expanding transit service to parks participating in the program could reduce the risks associated with impaired driving. So when considering the diversity of all perspectives that we have heard and all the information collected, we note that the mitigate, mitigation measures can help address some of the challenges identified, but not all. So we're here today with these four streams of information influencing the, a decision on this program. We're aware of the tension between competing interests and the data related to this topic. It's not a simply a data-driven decision. The literature has identified well-documented public health concerns associated with increased access and exposure to alcohol. The public opinion surveys told us that in the mainstream society, there's a general acceptance of consuming alcohol, and many people would like the ability to drink in, public, in city parks. Extensive links were undertaken to understand the perspectives of equity-deserving populations. Through the focused public engagement, we heard that within equity-deserving populations, support for alcohol in parks was less than the broader public. However, support still exists. And the pilot project showed us that operational impacts and enforcement issues are minimal. So depending on the weight that a person places on each individual data stream, it affects the perceptions of what the decision should be at the center of this. So we look forward to engaging in discussion with you and we'll be happy to answer any questions. That's great, thank you for the presentation. Um, any questions, colleagues? Councillor Rice, you had uh, selected this item. Would you like to start with questions? Uh, sure. So thank you for the uh, presentation and then lots of information there. So my first question, my first question is about that. What I heard here um, actually compared to the use, user of the parks, the number of users, like how many public users. So we have the low participant to put their inputs on their survey. So is that understanding correct? Correct. Okay, so that means this data is not sufficient and then we can really reflect the data-driven uh, informed decision. We can look at the uh, telephone survey to be representative of the Edmonton population. Uh, specifically that survey, we, we can look at it as statistically valid and representative. Um, so among 409 rep re respondents, 58 agree it needs to more drinking and driving, and 55 think it needs to more disordering behavior. And is that the information I, I read is correct, right? What we found is that those that were asked uh, shared that as their perception. They did not have actual experience with disorder in the parks. Yes, yeah, so th just the, based on the response and from this lower participant uh, response information. And also, and then 35% think it will need to more positive than negative, only 35%. And 48% think it encourages even more uh, drinking. So to me, and then it seems, and then the public engagement uh, is not sufficient and to provide the information for us to move forward. Uh, Councillor, last year, the committee or council had concerns about the engagement, so we did do a very robust analysis this year, the public engagement, the three different streams, the, the focus groups, the, 
the extensive GBA plus analysis. So I'm not sure what additional engagement we could do um, to bring this back to committee. Do we have a specific data like the per year and what's the public usage and for the parks? Like how many population? That is not data that we have. Okay. Um, so my next question, and was mothers against the drunk driving consultant as part of this evaluation process? So that's, it's called the MAD, was that organization? Let me, let me double check that data. Okay, so from what I am looking at as reports and information, I didn't see this specific organization was consultant as part of this evaluation process, but this is organization actually brought lots, lots of concern uh, for the drunk driving. So, okay, thank you, and I'm looking forward for that data. Um, so, another one, um, another question, do we have, yes, like the, do we have a breakdown for the 80% of Edmontonians um, agree drinking should be allowed in parks? And specifically, uh, based on what a group uh, you identified in the report, and I would like to see the breakdown. We have broken down the audience's seg uh, that were surveyed with various demographic factors, we'd be happy to share that. Uh, so, and then, is that fair to say, and then for the families who use the parks, and also for the newcomers come to the city, uh, try to enjoy this, our city's parks, and then is m most likely um, they don't support the alcohol consuming in the parks. So is that clear, right? Newcomers and those uh, equity deserving groups are less likely than the general public to support alcohol in parks, correct? Okay, thank you. I think that is my first one questions and then I may have other questions later. Okay. Thank you, Councillor Rice. Councillor Knack. Uh, thank you, Councillor Principal. So just, I wanna double check a few of these things. So, so in response on that last question, uh, for the equity serving groups, we, it was less likely, but it was still a majority, if I remember correctly. Is that correct? Still a component in proportion, yes, supported alcohol. Yeah, so, so, so still more said yes than no, but, but at a lower rate than the overall. Okay. As compared to the general public. Of correct. course, yeah, which is important still. Um, and, and I just want to make sure, again, I understand, because I appreciate the concern around, around data, but the, the phone survey that we did, again, it, it is statistic, statistically significant. That is something we didn't do in the past. And, and so we are very comfortable with sort of the, the validity of that study. Absolutely, we are comfortable that it is, represent, it is a representative yeah. sample. And when we look at it with the other means that we use to collect information, we're comfortable with the findings. Okay. Um, but, you know, and, and it is interesting. So, so while a majority did say that they supported that, uh, Councillor Rice identified a few areas where even, even though a majority said they support, a majority also said they might have concerns over aspects of these things happening. Was there any um, more detailed responses around sort of that difference? Because obviously if they flagged it as a concern, yet they still said they support it. So is it that they just fear that, or those concerns they feel are limited in scope or do you have any sense of, of why that difference might exist? When I was looking at, the, at the, the data, what I was most fascinated by was perception versus actual experience. Uh, the perception that alcohol in parks may lead to consequences was not actually experienced by anyone who had been to a park. Yeah, and, and I guess that's the big, the big question and the way I read the report and, and how you've outlined this, we also didn't experience that as a city from an enforcement standard, there wasn't you know, we, we were concerned two years ago when this first came up, there were a lot of concerns raised about what does that look like? What is that going to mean in, in terms of actual usage? And, and it doesn't seem like any of those concerns actually materialized. 
Is that fair to say? Yeah, that's correct. We shifted the enforcement model to being the reactive. Very few complaints. Uh, we also checked in with EPS about the number of any complaints that they had received and nothing that was in inaccessible we had heard before the pilots. And even just from a cleanliness perspective, the way I read the report, it didn't seem like even that was a concern, folks leaving bottles and cans lying around uh, in, a, in any type of meaningful way. Is that correct? Yeah, that's correct. Our, our crews in the park reported that the sites were being well maintained as they are after every picnic. There's no difference yeah. in the sites. Is this one of those, and I, I think part of why, you know, I don't want to speak for the original mover as they're not with us in, on this table anymore, but I, I think part of what I remember that in this conversation first coming up, it was one of those things that we sort of, even though we don't, we didn't want it to, it was happening at our parks. We, we, can, we can pretend it wasn't, but, but it was happening. And so I think the suggestion at the time from the council brought it forward was this might be a way to better help um, manage that and provide some rules and expectations around it. Because if it's going to happen anyways, is it better to design some, some standards that we would hope everyone would abide by? Is that sort of fair? Yeah, it's fair. I think the guidelines we put in place gave people that opportunity to do it in a, in a controlled and measured way. It wasn't that alcohol was allowed in parks. It was in the designated picnic sites only. And, uh, you know, the people who use those very much respected that in, in the 2022 pilot. Okay. Um, the report talks about if we are looking to make that permanent, you would need some type of, of motion to, to do that, correct? That's correct. Okay. Um, yeah, I, I mean, I'll, I'll listen to more. I mean, I, just from what I'm reading, I didn't see that there was any significant issue. And so I'd either be, and maybe there's a split of opinions on the committee too, so we can either requisition or, or discuss it there. But uh, I think those are all my questions. Thank you. And, and Councilor Nack, I could add to Councilor Rice's question. MAD wasn't interviewed specifically, but there were in the, in the interviews, there were 784 parents with children under 12, and 71% of them supported the pilot. Yeah. And they, yes, yeah, that, that's helpful. Thanks for that additional context. Those are all my questions. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Nack. I would just like to acknowledge Mayor Sohi has joined us. Hello. Thank you. Thank you. And Councillor Wright, you're up. Thank you very much. Um, I just want to confirm there are other city parks with picnic sites that do, that don't allow the alcohol. Is that right? That's right. Most, most parks don't allow it. We only identified a certain number of parks and a certain number of picnic sites within the park. So you would have the option of going to a, a park with no alcohol consumption or to a picnic site in a, in a park where it was allowed and still have no alcohol there. Okay. And the ones that are designated, are the picnic sites for alcohol sort of concentrated or are they spread out throughout the park? Like uh, there's different models based on the park. So in some places, they're a little bit more grouped together, and in other parks, they're dispersed. So okay. it's a variety of setups. Okay. And we did try and locate them in spots that were very visible, close to washrooms, um, accessible. There were a number of other factors that besides just spreading them out. Okay. And I did note, uh, read in the report, just since you mentioned the washrooms, um, but they're, they're not available in every park. Is that right? Where, there's, where there is alcohol Washrooms? Allowed? Yeah. I think, I think almost all the ones almost we selected for the pilot had, had washrooms okay, available. Okay, okay. Um, I'm just thinking Millwoods Park. I don't know if there was... Is there washrooms? Okay. Year-round? Okay, awesome. Um, okay, and then uh, my other question was... Um, the, the report also noted that you have the ability to remove sites that have ongoing problems. There weren't any ongoing problems noted where No, we, we expanded it in 2022 and we are not recommending removing any sites. Okay. And some of the considerations, uh, other considerations that were noted was uh, post clear and accessible signage in, in non-designated areas. Is, are there any plans for that or any of the other considerations? That's noted on page four of the, the report. I think it just requires some balance. Um, there's hundreds of picnic sites across mm -hmm. the city. So when we think about the volume of signs to label every single picnic site as not designated, it could become cumbersome itself. So I think it might be a strategic implementation where we note that we need to remind people uh, of those types of restrictions. Sort of at, at, on an as need basis or if you see any variance from yeah, and we're trying to get clear which sites are designated. Um, you know, th there's a balance, as Ms. Spence said, about we don't want a proliferation of signage through the river alley and through the no. parks. We, we still want them to be natural. So trying to be clear on where it's permitted and then in a more general sense that anywhere else it's not permitted. Okay, okay. I agree with that, yeah. Um, and even though there were some groups that did come forward to 
um, to voice their concerns. I, I see that it's noted that the majority of those groups did agree that drinking should be allowed. So even though MAD wasn't consulted, I think there was other groups. Absolutely, there were other groups uh, that, uh, that were consulted and as my colleague mentioned, uh, 784 parents with children under 12 and 71% of that group supported it. Okay, okay. And you did do the intercept surveys, people right on the spot, so it wasn't just all somebody who had a, a computer or telephone? We went, we, we went to where the, the action was. We okay. did intercept surveys on site. Okay, and enforcement, um, there's no, not gonna be any special enforcement. It'll just be just the standard park rangers that will be uh, monitoring it? Yeah, we'd stick with the same model we used this year if council wanted to do it again where they would respond to any complaints that were brought in, but no, no proactive enforcement looking for problems. Okay. Okay, um, thank you, that's all I had. Thank you, Councillor Wright. Councillor Stevenson. Yes, thank you. I think I'll, I'll also be brief. Just wanted to really commend the work uh, that was done. I think the reports are excellent and, and definitely answered the question that, that we needed answered. So, so really value that work and, uh, and appreciate um, you giving us the evidence to be able to make these decisions, so thank you. Um, you know, my colleagues have asked, has asked a lot of the pertinent questions. I think something else that stood out to me is that, you know, particularly with the intercept surveys as well, the awareness of the, the pilot was actually quite low. Very few people were actually even aware, which again to me suggests that they're maybe not witnessing any, any changes in, in the parks where it was allowed. Is that a fair assumption? That would be a fair assumption, correct. Great. And um, if, if we were to provide direction to move forward, uh, you know, in my mind, we've, we've sort of shown proof of concept. The first year it was a smaller number. We've, we've grown that number. Is the idea from administration that uh, you would um, sort of look holistically at the city's entire park inventory at this point to identify appropriate sites? Or what, what is administration thinking in terms of scale of moving forward? I th I think we are suggesting a program very similar to 2023, but with the opportunity to have some flexibility in the event that we do find there are problem sites that we may want to remove in the future or new ones we want to add, but I think it would be a very similar program to what we we implemented uh, oh, okay. in 2022. So similar similar number of sites. Um, and then if, a, if there was a community that, that wished to have a designated site in their neighborhood, is that something that they can request moving forward? Or is, is that, could that be part of the program? It could be, we need to look at it, as you know, or for, I should say, as you know, in the first year it was only River Valley Parks and we expanded to some top of bank parks and district parks. I think the, the idea is about staying away from children's amenities, away from playgrounds. I think those would all factor into looking at which parks might be appropriate, the available washrooms, um, so I don't, I don't we would need to put in some kind of process to consider options for, for future sites if that was council's will. Perfect, perfect. And yeah. just to add to that, I don't think there are that many more parks that we, we would consider top of bank that would meet kind of the criteria that we developed. Um, we really tried to focus on the larger parks and stay away from neighborhoods, so there aren't a lot of additional parks that we'd consider. Okay, no, and, that's... Oh, and the ahead. act only allows us to do it in designated picnic sites, the provincial act, so it would have to be a what designated bookable picnic site. Right, right. Okay, no, that, that's actually very helpful. I mean, I certainly... Um, uh, you know, that seems like a very reasonable approach and, and really appreciate administration's consideration of, um, you know, being really thoughtful about where those are being put in. Uh, again, avoiding, that was one, gonna be one of my other questions as well, that we're, you know, gonna uphold that this wouldn't be co-located with, with children's play equipment, things like that. Great, okay. Nope. Uh, yeah, thank you. Again, uh, the report was so clear. I have, I have very few questions, so thank you so much. Thank you, Councillor Stevenson, Mayor Sohi. Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, I know you engaged with a uh, few experts uh, on the on the public engagement. Uh, what I want to get a sense is uh, uh, if you engaged with experts with some of a kind of anti-racism lens or equity lens when it comes to enforcement and also uh, uh, from a public health perspective. Absolutely, and maybe I'll ask my, my colleague Cecily Pouquet to weigh in on the, uh, the logistics of that. Cecily. Absolutely, thanks very much, Ryan. Um, we did have in-depth interviews and user experience mapping with individuals representing a cross-section of identities, including mothers, Muslim, Indigenous, and LGBTQ2S persons. It also included one CSAB member, 
Um, in terms of other folks that we heard from, from uh, the intercept surveys, we heard from 28 unhoused and or street involved persons, uh, 21 indigenous persons, 19 persons identifying as black and 39 persons of color. Uh, we also heard from 23 Islamic persons, 13 Hindu, 10 Sikh, uh, 22 with annual household incomes less than 59,000, 70 with children under 18 living in the household, 25 with an elementary school education or less, and 10 who have immigrated to Canada within the last five years. Okay, so that's a kind of broad spectrum of engagement, right? But I just want to get a sense on the, uh, uh, the specific expertise on um, having equity and anti-racism lens applied to these policies as we move toward building a community that is kind of embracing and welcoming of all of us, right? And uh, that probably let me frame it another way, enforcement. Enforcement can be uneven. It can be perceived on bias, right? And uh, 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 on a perceived bias, sorry. Uh, and then is there data kind of that will kind of allay my fears that is it's not based on somebody's perceived race or somebody being perceived in different ways, right? So I, that's what I'm trying to get at as we, as, uh, uh, if there's any data collected on that, right? Who got ticketed, who, uh, uh, who got warnings, right? And, uh, uh, and uh, yeah, they, we, we didn't do the proactive enforcement. We, we responded to complaints. There were five warnings issued last year. There were no tickets given. Um, so it was, we're, we're pleased the way that I think the enforcement was handled. But all, yeah, only five of infractions and all were just warnings, no okay. tickets issued. Yeah, okay. Okay, so uh, I'm moving forward. If this goes ahead, uh, how, do you, how do you keep applying that, that equity and anti-racism lens to some of the work? Uh, will that be part of the plan or like how, if we were to go ahead on this? Mayor Sohi, I think we implemented a lot of the mitigation measures that we heard from some equity deserving groups. Yeah. Um, you know, making sure that there are opportunities in other parks where there is no alcohol consumption, separating it from children's amenities. So people have a choice of where they want to go. So not every park offers alcohol. Um, so people do have an option to go to a park that doesn't allow alcohol. Oh. I think signage, um, and some education we did talk about. So many of the mitigation measures that were recommended, we've already looked to implement. Um, and we can always continue with, I think, um, you know, more information on our websites, uh, through social media, and just uh, keeping that awareness alive. Okay. And uh, the, I think one concern that we heard, a lot, it wasn't last summer or summer before, uh, around in increased enforcement in areas where consumption, alcohol consumption is not allowed, but a uh, certain area where it's allowed, now that you want to enforce people not drinking in other areas where it's not allowed, right? That led to some concerns from community members. There's, a, there's an increased enforcement or the signage that kind of gave warnings to people. Just want to get your thoughts on that. I don't know if David Jones or, or Troy want to weigh in on that from the enforcement side. I can uh, defer to David Jones on that. That's all right. Dave? It's okay. Maybe I can follow up off, offline. Yeah, I'm, we, I'm, we have some data. Uh, certainly from the police service, they, you know, there were only 35 calls uh, to the right. value on issues related to alcohol is the key word in the search. So what, that was consistent with sort of pre-pilot. Uh, okay. there, there's no real change in the, in the police enforcement. And I think our staff are saying there was okay. you know, only five warnings issued all last year. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Mayor Sohi. Councillor Paquette? Yeah, thank you. Um, I, yeah, I just wanted to follow up on that. Um, what was the nature of the warnings? For 2022, sir? Yeah. Uh, so we had uh, five warnings in total. Three were related to consuming liquor in public place, and two were related to public intoxication. Okay. And that was all in the pilot zone? Uh, only two were in pilot zone, sir. Right. Okay. So if, so in the pilot zone, two warnings were given out of a million people. Okay. So um, I, I just wanted to also follow up on 
a little bit of the methodology and uh, the, the responses. Um, do we often get 80% approval for a new uh, potentially controversial policy? I'll ask Sham Yang to weigh in on that. Uh, to me, that seems um, irregular, but I'll look for Shan's uh, opinion on that. Sure, Councillor Paquette, um, 80% is on the higher end um, of an, an issue that is controversial. Yeah, and, and I would assume uh, my reading of this, and maybe uh, analysis is not your forte or purpose here, but uh, when you hear 80%, maybe the decision isn't actually controversial at all. Like, would we consider 80% approval to be controversial? Well, in terms of the number um, at 80% is, is, is total, it's definitely different from, uh, say, a 45-55 uh, split. Yeah, and I also noticed in the report that um, with the with the question asked, it, um, when it came to the uh, the the number of parks and the number of sites, it also had overwhelming support uh, for uh, the pilot numbers that uh, that administration and council eventually landed on. Is that your reading as well? Support with encouragement to grow was the was the finding that the research revealed. Yeah, that's what I see. Okay, yeah. By the way, it was a great report. Um, there was a question about um, if this was deep enough or broad enough engagement. Uh, we've been doing a pilot now for two years, uh, and our information it looks like was much deeper in the second year. Um, as far as the engagement. Um, do we often do engagement on single policy items like this to this extent? This would because be I can see that kind of engagement for a city plan. This this would be considered deeper. This was in response to council's request to go back and do additional engagement and come back with those findings. Yeah, and do we often do pilot projects for two years? We do not. Right. Okay. Uh, thank you. Very, very clear. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Councillor Paquette. Councillor Salvador? Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, I would just echo some of the comments that have been made around the, the clarity of this report. I think it was very strong. Um, so thanks to administration for bringing something so, uh, so excellent forward. Um, yeah, I guess just, just one lingering question that I had. Uh, was around some of the mitigating factors. Uh, I know public washrooms were mentioned as um, one of one of those factors we're trying to co-locate to ensure that folks have access to that. Um, just on the, the public transit front, um, that seems like a, an important one as well. Uh, right now, do the majority of the sites have connectivity to public transit? Uh, most sites don't have excellent <laughs> access to transit. So you may find yourself walking a fair distance from the nearest stop. Okay. Okay. And I think that's something, I mean, obviously uh, important to this conversation, but part of our, our broader conversation about ensuring everyone has equitable access to our, our parks and green spaces. Um, okay. And yeah, I think that's actually it for me. Uh, again, not too many questions. Um, the data is very clear that, that folks are supportive. So thank you. Thank you, Councillor Salvador. Um, I actually have just a couple of questions. I guess I should sign up here to speak. I, I, you had mentioned about uh, possibility of requiring food being available. What, what, are, what are the requirements now, like legally, establishments have to have food available. Is that only when liquor is sold or is it when liquor is consumed? According to the act, uh, there's no additional requirements when we're talking picnic sites. Formerly there was a food requirement, but the province removed that a few years ago. So, so there's no connecting requirements currently in the act. Okay, good, thanks. That was actually my only question, thank you. 
and Councillor Tang. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, yes, I uh, just want to thank the staff for this report. It was in response to the motion that I have put forward. Uh, you know, certainly heard lots of perspectives, and I think for anyone involved in public engagement, we know it's you're not going to be able to get 100% of the population, but as someone said during the presentation, it's really the quality of those conversations. Um, I guess just a couple of things I was I was curious about. Um, I guess first on the engagement, uh, did did this round um, give you anything any new information? Or I'm wondering if the administration can comment on kind of the journey uh, you know this exercise has taken. Um, yeah. Thank you for the question. I think it gave us a, a better understanding of the differences amongst Edmontonians, especially from those groups uh, deserving equity considerations. It allowed us uh, more and deeper understanding of how to engage, communicate, and better understand those, those wishes and how to prioritize them. Uh, I'll ask Cecily to weigh in as well on anything that uh, she saw coming out of this additional round. Thanks very much for that, Ryan. Um, I think because the ask was to go deeper with GBA plus um, communities, we just had a lot more insight in terms of what their specific experience was. Um, we found that there was a much lower awareness of the program. Um, in general, there was less support uh, for the program as compared to um, the, the research, um, but the feedback wasn't entirely negative or in opposition to alcohol consumption in parks. And to mm -hmm. add, Councillor Tang, I think it really mm -hmm. helped validate um, what administration uh, had experienced from the two years of pilots. It really helped validate our assumptions of um, people's experience in using alcohol in parks. Mm -hmm. No, I really appreciate that. Um, yeah, I, you know, I, I thought I, I also thought was the, I also thought the report was quite thorough and. Uh, anyways, uh, appreciate those feedback. Um, so I, I think you also mentioned uh, during the presentation that that the February or January, uh, the CCSA report uh, report around the new guidelines. Um, I wonder if you can just elaborate on that point and how that factored into the study, because I, I recall when that kind of came out, you know, it wasn't without its own uh, debates around around uh, that policy. So I would say it was just one input into it. The, the notion of the public health considerations came up in the, the first evaluation of the pilot. The, the mm -hmm. more accessible, the more exposure to alcohol, the impacts that it can have on people, uh, the normalization of alcohol consumption. Um, but we weighed that against all the other inputs as well. And, and you know, we're, we rely on the public health experts and you know, our, our recommendation, our, you know, our evaluation indicated that there is more people in favor of it than, than those that are concerned about uh, the health risks. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, that's great. Thank you. Um, and I, you know, I certainly hope moving forward with there, there will be continued conversation between the city and AHS and, and the public health experts, right? You know, the health guidelines are more about the, the volume of consumption, not the location where that consumption takes place. Right, right. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, I guess just from an administrative perspective, like, um, I mean, so far we've been doing this on an annual basis. You come back and we have a debate and we say yay or nay. And, you know, at this point, there's lots of signage that's been put up. Um, you know, like, is it, does it make sense to keep being on this annual basis um, on a year to year basis without, you know, a permanent bylaw? I'm not sure we need a bylaw council or counselor, um, oh, sorry. but the, yeah. the annual well, more, evaluation and uncertainty, it would probably be better if council made a decision whether to proceed allowing alcohol and picnic right. sites or, or not. Right. Um, yeah, because I imagine there's there's also cost in, you know, taking things down and, uh, and you know, re resetting things as well. Um, in the report, you also mentioned that, you know, alcohol consumption or possession of or the or the limit is something that could be considered. Uh, is that something done in other places? And um, you know, you mentioned there's only five complaints, so one of which was over intoxication. So you know, made, just made me think about you know, is overconsumption an issue that's fairly common in these pilots? And how would the limits even be enforced? Uh, Councillor, I think um, 
with s specifics to other municipalities? Is that the, you asked that particular question? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I know yeah, Vancouver so has implemented a permanent uh, alcohol and parks program, and they're also looking to extend that into their beaches, and this is just recent conversations I had with them uh, a couple of weeks ago, and Calgary's continuing with their alcohol and parks, although they haven't formally uh, made it permanent. So I know those two municipalities are heading more towards uh, allowing it. Um, and then I think your other question was just around enforcement, is that correct, and overconsumption? Yeah. We can, my, we can come back for a second I'm round for that. Thank you. Thank you. Sorry. Councillor Rice? Mayor so hey you want it? Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> so, because uh, right now I, uh, I heard some good questions from my colleagues. I do want to focus on resources efficiency. So based on the past few experience and from our enforcement model, I recall the city council approved some FT for the last time when we implemented that pilot project. So is that, does that mean if we move forward, we will not request additional FTEs, additional uh, budget? So can you comment on that? Yeah, that's correct. Our plan going forward is that we would, we would be able to manage the program within existing resources. So you will use existing resources? Yeah, given the number of incidents we had, um, you know, people can call 311 to have a park ranger dispatched. We'll, we'll just continue with our, as we do with any other incidents in the parks. And also no additional uh, operating budget request? That's correct. Uh, so if that's the case, are you still planning to keep the same 18 uh, sites or you are planning to increase the sites for the uh, alcohol consumption allowed? Because right now, uh, in to total sites and based on report is 18, uh, how many parks and how many sites and do you have that data and across the entire city in the parks? Yeah, this year we did 124 picnic sites in 18 parks. So that was an increase from 47 the year before and seven, and I, as I think we mentioned earlier. Like how many sites allowed the alcohol assumption? 18 parks. Okay, so that's his, my research. So are you planning to in, expand any of that if this uh, project is moving forward or you keep the same? Yeah, I think our plan would be if council wanted to continue, we would continue in a, in a very similar program, but as, as Councilor had asked earlier, we may you know have some criteria around expanding the program over time and, and how we'd look at additional sites down the road, but the, we would look at roll, rolling out a very similar program next year if that was council's wish. The only change would be Horlock's closing in 2023, so that would be removed from the uh, from the program. From from program, and but you are not like extend because from 2021 to 2022 uh, increase for seven parks. So you are not from 22 to 23 the increase another uh, seven parks or something. You will keep the same scale. So I, I, just I think, want yeah, moving into 2023, we'd keep a very similar program. As noted earlier, you know, just allowing administration to have the flexibility if we do find that there are significant challenges with one site that we'd have the option to go in and make some adjustments, but our intent okay. is to keep it very similar. Um, also, and because these are four sites of data and to, to inform this project, if move forward or not, and even though they're 80% uh, public supports, but among 80%, like my first question I asked earlier, still over half, like 58% uh, agree to needs to more drinking and driving. And then also over 55% thinks it needs to more disorders behaviors. So I, I just want to be uh, clarify and my understanding is correct. And because for four sets of data, we cannot just look at one set of data, we have the combination to interpret. Is that correct? For sure, and I would just offer what uh, Ryan had mentioned earlier, just the, the complication between uh, perception and reality. Uh, so, my luck, thank you for that. And uh, my last question is, this is a question on behalf of my constituents. If we already have existing spaces, including restaurants, including that other type of uh, spaces for the drinking, and then, however, the parks only the one uh, unique place and for people who don't drink to go there. 
and then how that, if we continue to move this, how that equity concept and then reflect in this project and for the people who don't drink and use parks and because they don't, for drink we already have existing spaces. Yeah, so we are in only 18 of the 900 parks and with, even within those parks we're making sure that there's picnic sites that don't have alcohol consumption permitted at them. Okay, uh, I just want to get sense from a uh, committee member, uh, is, is uh, we want to receive us information or we just want recognition to the council for final decision? And then because uh, I my original plan is to put a uh, motion on the floor as uh, city ma administration provided reports received as information. So, but I, I want to get a sense from my like, committee member. Uh, I'm willing to put forward a motion. Okay, so you have uh, some motion on, on place? Uh, okay. Yeah. And then I will leave that for you. Okay. Thank you, Councillor Rice. Councillor Knack? Yeah, th thank you, Councillor Prince Fayol. Uh, just very quickly, because I think Councillor Paquette has a motion, but uh, this can be approved by committee uh, if, if desired, correct? Yes, that's true. Yeah, okay. Uh, yeah, I think, and I think there's at least 10 members of council attending the meeting right now, so I, I, I'd be comfortable with Councillor Paquette putting forward a motion, and unless there's a desire from the rest of council to have it sent up, I don't know if we need to requisition it anymore. So I'm, I'm, I'll stop talking because now I'm speaking to it. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Knack. Councillor Paquette? Yeah, I heard Councillor Knack say a, a word. I better not repeat it. Otherwise, we're sending it up. Uh, so, yeah, thank you. Uh, just to, maybe first I'll throw the, the, um, the motion I've got on the floor and uh, I'll read it in right now. That administration implements an alcohol in parks program at designated picnic sites on an ongoing basis and that the program be managed with existing budgets aligning with guiding principles and as permitted in the Alberta Gaming Liquor and Cannabis Act. Thank you, Councillor Paquette. We have a motion on the floor and you can speak to it. Great, uh, yeah, well, I'll speak, uh, I'll, speak, I'll speak, quick to it. I'll quickly speak to it. Uh, and uh, so, <laughs> Um, this, I think that uh, this is uh, obviously uh, a program that uh, is uh, wanted by the people of Edmonton and uh, after two years of pilots, I don't think that we've got any issues uh, that we saw and uh, so I will just leave it at that until it's time to close. Thank you, Councillor Paquette. Yeah. All right, so I've got one quick question. Oh, uh, go ahead. Please go okay. ahead. And, and that would be, um, you know, being very sensitive to uh, the cultural aspect of uh, what we heard as, uh, you know, maybe people not being comfortable. Um, my question would be, are there other, uh, are there other activities or uh, foods or beverages that we prohibit from uh, from public spaces based on dietary restrictions. I, I don't believe based on dietary restrictions, there's certainly conditions around smoking of tobacco, cannabis, uh, other regulations, but not, not based on dietary restrictions. Yeah, and uh, the reason for the tobacco cannabis uh, would be that uh, you've got the impact of secondhand uh, smoke where people might ingest that uh, involuntarily. That's correct. Yeah. So if it doesn't affect someone else, no one's being uh, forced to consume something, we don't have a restriction. Yeah. That's right. Correct. Sorry, I wasn't sure that was a question. Yeah, I think. Yeah, yeah, sorry. <laughs> Open ended flat tone did not help. All right. Okay, well, thank you uh, for that. Those are all my questions. Thank you, Councillor Paquette. Uh, Councillor Knack is just to speak to the motion. Uh, Councillor Stevenson, are you just to speak? Yeah. And Councillor Rice, are you to speak? Okay, then uh, please, Councillor Knack, go ahead. Uh, thank you, Councillor Prince Bay. Um, yes, so happy to support this motion. I, I, I'll be honest, I'm passionately indifferent about it. Uh, <laughs> uh, as somebody that doesn't 
drink. It's it's not something that I think is going to affect my life at all. Um, but but I think more importantly, I actually am really glad. I want to thank Councillor Tang for the motion that led to this report. I um, because uh, frankly, it gave the information to me that showed you know the majority of Edmontonians want it. Um, while they raised thoughts uh, about perception of concerns in the actual pilots, they haven't materialized. We can do this without any c increase to the budget. Um, so in my mind, there's no reason not to do this at this point. If we're not going to spend any more money, Edmontonians want it. We actually haven't seen the negative impacts that we, we assumed. Then that's a, that to me is a win. Um, and, and I mean, this is a, a good example of, of maybe taking some time before jumping into something that, that could have been perceived to be really concerning for folks. Um, just because I think it was already wide, uh, widely happening amongst uh, in our parks across the city um, doesn't mean we should just do it for the sake of doing it. And so there was a thoughtful process that led to this thoughtful engagement that came to uh, provide this. So I just want to thank the, all the team who did the work on this. It was a really great report and I mean truly you know, gave me no reason to, to say no to this at this point. Um, and, uh, and over the course of the pilot, I also never heard any concerns from residents. Uh, I had had concerns about the perception that there were going to be issues, but again, similarly, it just never materialized in any of the spaces. So I, I never had one complaint come in. Uh, and I did have some folks who reached out and said, oh, it's good that we have this option available to us. So uh, while I, I won't partake uh, in a drink with you at the park, uh, I'm happy to let many others uh, enjoy that opportunity in a responsible way and hope to see this continue. And, and also glad to know that there's the flexibility within city administration to adjust, right? Because um, we might learn new things. It's been two years, so I think we have a good data set and a good sample size, but if things start happening and something goes sideways, I know that you have the flexibility to do what you need to do, and so again, I'm, I'm comfortable. And if we ever did get to a point, and I guess the, the flag is if we ever did get to a point where there were starting to be significant issues, um, my hope would be that that would be identified and that we would have a conversation about this, because um, you know, I don't want to have to do this and have a large budget for enforcement because things are going off to the side. But again, it seems like you have that flexibility in terms of doing this. So I will uh, support this. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Knack. Councillor Rice. So I, I appreciate the intention of this motion and specifically and then the good point in the motion about um, within existing budgets and resources also align with um, uh, some guiding principles and permitting the Alberta Game uh, Liquor and uh, Cannabis Act. Um, however, I cannot support this motion. And then I, I think based on my question I asked um, and also from the um, the engagement for from public for the full set of data and then how we interpret that data and is one way, another way is the balance of the data, how we interpret. And even though we have 80% uh, on the surface say we support that, but if you look at the breakdown and for the concerns uh, that reflect still over half of our Edmontonians has a concern about the cu culture sensitivity piece and then also the safety concerns and for the five many arcades and to use a park and also for the green spaces and then usage. And like I said earlier, and then also this reflects what I heard as well. And if we already have existing spaces and for the alcohol assumption, why we need to extend it and for, to use our, our green spaces. Actually, our ma many, f that's his family gathering places, people enjoying there to do the exercise, to in relaxing. And I think equity piece and needs to look at the front broad picture and then to approve a every group in specific if we look at the culture sensitivity. And then we have like 70 ethnic groups and across the entire city. And then their voice to, to be heard, needs to be heard as well. And then and specifically if you do the uh, 
balance in preparation of the data results. And I still think in, instead of in the future, we come back uh, to discuss again and with something happening. And then I'd rather to mitigate the risk at the beginning. Specifically, we have so many other priorities in our city. Needs our focus, needs our park staff, and focus on to do it. And I'd rather just accept uh, our um, city administration they received us information. And instead of to move, continue move forward, and let's use our resources, let's use our um, priority based and to move forward cities programs and services and specifically summertime and more more family and come out to enjoy our green spaces um, I didn't say and even without moving this program and people cannot enjoy the drinking because they still have lots of other spaces in the city and we and I believe our city and we have a larger like um, patio program and to support our people to enjoy drinking as well. And at the same time, other people's concern needs to be addressed. So I cannot support this, thank you. Thank you, Councillor Rice. Mayor Sohi? Yeah, thank you. I wanna thank our administration for this report as well as Councillor Tang for initiating this uh, initial uh, inquiry. Uh, I am gonna support this uh, for, uh, for a few reasons. One is that as we build more denser communities and we build housing that doesn't have a big backyard or, or, or any backyard at all. And, uh, and we revitalize our business districts and we build up instead of spreading out um, people living in condominiums, people living in uh, apartment buildings. Uh, they, if they wanna gather with friends, uh, they need to have opportunity to uh, go somewhere in a greener space that they can enjoy themselves. I think it's, uh, it's equity from that point of view as well, right? Because uh, not everyone can afford to have a backyard um, as, we, as we build a city that is more denser and more compact. So I think it's important from that point of view. Uh, I am actually pleased with the survey results that uh, uh, we have not seen any disorder issues or uh, people causing disturbance to people enjoying the u other users of the of the park. So that tell you that Edmontonians are pretty, uh, you know, we get along fine, right? Uh, as long as we understand the parameters and uh, maybe as part of our communication, continue to remind people that parks are for everyone, including those who may want to have a get together with family and enjoy a beer on a, on a hot summer day, right? So uh, I think it's good from that point of view. Only caution I want to flag, and again, this is not related to this. Uh, this is related to overall enforcement of bylaws and uh, uh, is that we, we make sure that we are bias-free in, uh, in our enforcement uh, and uh, that we are not working with presumption that certain groups will cause more disturbance or certain groups will consume more, I think, and all that, right? I think it's, a, uh, it's just, a, uh, just a caution. I don't have any data to suggest in this case that is the case that is happening in this case uh, because uh, uh, enforcement is very kind of reactive based on complaints uh, and very few warnings and tickets, right, if there are any, right? So I think it's not related to specifically to this, but just an overall observation as we, uh, as we think about more equitable city, as we think about more fair and bias-free city that uh, our assumptions and presumptions do not create um, uh, situations where people get unfairly, unfairly targeted. You know, I, I, you know, I'm rumbling about it, but I know what, it, what I'm saying, right? I, I hope you understand what I'm saying around that, right? So, yeah. So uh, look forward to uh, 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 to the outcome of this. Yeah. Thank you, Mayor Sohi. Councillor Stevenson. Thank you. Um, I'll also say a huge thank you to uh, Councillor Tang for this motion and to administration for fulfilling this work so so well. Um, it it certainly gives us the information that we need. I think to see that this is something that's welcomed in our our community, but also needs to be done um, in a balanced way. 
you know, representing Ward O'Damon, uh, you know, over 70% of residents live in, in multifamily housing, so they don't have access to a backyard where they can have friends over for a barbecue. Um, so this is really meaningful in, in, in the community I represent. Uh, but I think it's, it's great for all Edmontonians as well. It's a different way to come together. And what I appreciate most uh, with the approach the administration has laid out is that, you know, as was mentioned, there still will be parks that are uh, completely alcohol free so that that choice and availability is, is there for everyone. Uh, I think that's a, a huge part of creating an inclusive community and um, really appreciate all the work that's gone into this. I hope my account committee colleagues will, will support this. I mean, not, you're not my colleagues on committee, my council <laughs> colleagues on committee will support it. Thank you. Yes, we're always colleagues. Yeah, <laughs> Councillor Wright. Thank you very much, Chair Principe. Um, I, I want to start by um, acknowledging and, and thanking the representatives from the Community Services Advisory Board um, for bringing forward these concerns initially after the first pilot. Um, and I'm quite surprised that that no one showed up to speak today. Um, I guess I'll hear about it at, at tomorrow's uh, board meeting. So, um, but I, and, and for Councillor Tang then for, for putting forward the motion to, to do some further engagement and making sure that we were considering all those risks and concerns um, that the CSAB committee brought forward. Um, and with this extensive public engagement, um, I think, I think, I mean, overall the 80%, um, you know, a sort of approval rating, but I think we also have to consider that minor minority um, that, that maybe are gonna be, or, or had, had thought that they might be impacted a little bit more um, than, than that other 80%. And as uh, Mayor Sohi has indicated, can I say it any better than you? I don't think so. Um, just making sure that our, info our enforcement is, and I think you said unbiased, yes. Um, and, and I think the evidence has shown um, that there really hasn't been a lot of that drunken behavior um, that, that, that was brought forward as a concern um, in impacting those, um, those that were, uh, I guess, more of a detractor of the, of the pilot. Um, and there are uh, other great opportunities within our River Valley to visit other parks that, um, that don't have uh, drinking allowed and, um, and other city parks across, across the city. So I guess I would ask also my colleagues um, to support this. And um, yeah, we, we had a lot of discussion over the, the past committees. Um, and uh, I, I think our, at least my concerns have been alleviated with the, with the really thorough engagement that um, that administration has completed. So thank you. Thank you, Councillor Wright. Councillor Tang? Great, thank you very much, Madam Chair. Um, yes, I, you know, I think a lot has been said, so I just wanted to maybe highlight uh, maybe a few of the thoughts. Um, first, uh, many thanks to this, you know, to a lot of the members of the public who participate in the last round when this report came forward. Um, I really think the participation from the public really helped to shift uh, the conversation last time. I remember speaking to some of my council colleagues who maybe went into the meeting not thinking this is such a big deal, but from the dialogue, you know, there's a lot of really, I think, important perspectives uh, that were highlighted, you know, once again, you know, shows the importance of civic participation and the power of speaking directly to decision makers. Um, I thought this was a really good report, and I've said this offline to administration, and I will say that again here. I thought the GBA plus section was really strong. Um, I actually, when I was reading it, I was thinking this should be the new standard for GBA plus analysis. Um, uh, but I, I recognize this kind of depth. There's a, you know, among many reasons, um, it, it also, you know, came at a cost as well, and it's not feasible or realistic. Uh, to really have that level of rigor for for every single uh, policy, um, and and anyways, it, it made me think a lot about kind of you know what can be done to invest such rigor, but more cost effective ways. Um, I also thought the you know the the uh, the feedback in the report also gave us shed some light uh, too, showing that you know cultural and faith communities are not homogenous. 
bodies. I was glad to see the diversity of feedback. Um, you know, I think as city government, it's important for us to do our best to reach out to people who might often, you know, not not be heard or not directly come out to participate in these meetings. Um, I think that intentionality is really important. And I saw that in this report. Um, so I just really want to thank the, you know, the staff members who who really led the uh, the response on this motion. Um, and I want to add too, I was pleased to see and hear during the presentation today about the public health considerations, uh, you know, being mindful of the latest guidelines and recommendations nationwide, having that as one stream of input into uh, this report, um, and that there will be connection and conversations with public health practitioners moving forward. Um, and finally, you know, I, I, I want to maybe highlight this uh, line from the report. It was from a participant during a, the focused um, the, the focus groups um, about how this pilot program really shows the city's trust in patrons to use the parks responsibly. I feel like I don't typically hear comments like that um, in public engagement. Um, you know, this past year, you know, through some of the project, the community-based budgeting project that uh, that we worked on in our ward. Um, together with Councilor Nack, you know, the theme of trust with our government, our local government, and its residents has surfaced quite a bit. Uh, I thought that was really interesting. And, um, and, and once again, you know, I feel like if had we not gone to this level of detail, we probably wouldn't be able to surface insights like that. So uh, I'm glad to see it. And then we'll also be really open, you know, as a side note, how do we ensure, you know, gens like that continue to surface um, in rigorous GBA plus analysis that 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 doesn't have to, um, uh, you know, be done, you know, um, with high cost. Um, but I just want to say, you know, well done, and I really appreciated this information. Thank you, Councillor Tang. Um, so I just wanted to say that, you know, we talk about perception, right? When it comes to feeling safe though perception is reality how someone you people want to feel safe and if they perceive they're not safe then that is their reality so that is my concern because i have also heard many concerns lately of social disorder i'm not saying that this would cause social disorder but there's a potential for it i i'm i was really surprised also with seeing the results with seeing um the support from the general community um, because we didn't see that result last time you were before us. I just don't think that this is the right time to be supporting this. I think there are other issues, as Councillor Ray said, there are other issues that maybe we need to uh, rectify first and, and deal with first and then this is something that could be implemented. So I, I do thank the work that you did because it's a lot of work and I think you've, you've done a good job. And the other thing is that now we're taking a, a reactive approach as, a, as opposed to a proactive approach. So that uh, it concerns me that, and I know that that helps with budgetary, but that concerns me that there may be issues going on that we're not aware of. So that's why I can't support it at this time. This is something that I would have liked to have seen maybe in the future, I think maybe would have been a more appropriate time. So thank you, Councillor Paquette. Next, you're next. Oh, thank you, Councillor Principal. And I may differ from your opinion, but uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, so we already know that, that people are doing this and they have been doing this since Edmonton began. Uh, you know, they just throw their drink in, in, a, in, a, in a travel mug or something like that and off they go. It's already been happening. Um, the only issue is that uh, um, it's it's we've basically been forcing people to uh, break a bylaw, and that doesn't make a lot of sense. Um, we have never seen such widespread buy-in from the public. I don't think on anything, at least not in my time on council. And uh, so I think the public has, has uh, spoken loud and clear. Now, the fact is, no matter what we do, no matter what decision we make on any number of issues, there are going to be people who support and people who don't support. That is fine, and that's a fact. Um, but 
one thing that is incumbent on us as governors is to govern not on perception, but on facts. Um, if we governed on perception, uh, there are a lot of decisions we would make that would essentially just start bleeding the budget dry. And uh, so we've got to be very careful about that. And I noticed that a lot of the concerns uh, that were stated are concerns that actually never materialized over two years. And I get it because when this uh, was first floated, I had my concerns. I had many of the same concerns that were stated in the report. But I have to look at the evidence and the facts and based on evidence and facts change uh, my stance. And so my concern has, has uh, essentially evaporated. My perception of what could go wrong did not go wrong. And so I hope that people who are watching uh, or who were concerned about this will find that their concerns actually won't occur and uh, that they've actually been going to green spaces where people are already uh, consuming alcohol for the past two years. And so not much will change. Um, there is a huge turnout on engagement and that's a clear directive from Edmontonians. And I'm happy that uh, we are aligning with the best practices uh, of other jurisdictions around the world who've been doing the same thing or who have done it for centuries, for millennia. This is not a new idea, um, just new here. And the equity piece on who we are targeting with restrictions against alcohol, ticketing and enforcement uh, is something that we should probably also keep in mind. And it would be, I think, uh, deeply confusing to the public to pilot something for two years to see extremely successful results and then roll back the programming. So uh, for all those reasons, um, I have changed my stance and I obviously am going to vote in favor of this. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Councillor Paquette. Please vote. We have three votes. Sorry, we have five votes. <laughs> I was looking at it. That's great. Please display the it vote. It passed with three to two, yes. And that has carried. Thank you very much. And now we're off to 7.2, City of Edmonton and Edmonton Elks License Agreement. And do we have a presentation? We do. We're just gonna wait for um, our friends to join. All right, before you today is a report brought forward seeking approval for the license agreement between the Edmonton Elks Football Club and the City of Edmonton for the purpose of providing professional football in the City of Edmonton at Commonwealth Stadium. I will pass this over to Roger Jeffney, branch manager of the Community Recreation and Culture branch to get into further details. Thanks, Jennifer. <coughs> Pardon me. And before we start, I'll introduce Victor Quee. He's part of our delegation. Victor is the president and CEO of the Edmonton Elks Football Club. So we're bringing this report forward today because of the overall value of the license agreement being almost $5 million and so it exceeds the city manager's delegated authority. Commonwealth Stadium has been home to the Elks Football Club since it opened in 1978. And the, the license agreement to use Commonwealth Stadium it expired in January of this year. And we need to enter into a new agreement with the Elks to continue allowing them to use the stadium for Canadian Football League games. So if approved, the agreement will be effective from April 1st, 2023, for approximately five years, ending at the end of 2017. And part of this agreement, the Edmonton Elks Football Club has requested that the license fee be waived for 2023 and 2024 in consideration of the team's post-pandemic recovery strategies and the financial position of the football team. The license fee is a portion of the total fees collected under the agreement, and it's related to the use of the space in the facility. The Edmonton Elks also remit to the city an emissions surcharge on a per game ticket redeemed at the stadium, a game day staffing charge that covers security staff, ushers, and field maintenance, and a portion of concession sales. So Victor has a brief presentation that he'd like to share with you, and we'll hand it over to him, and then we'll be pleased collectively to answer your questions afterwards. 
great. Thank you very much. Good morning. Thank you very much. It is, uh, I just want to start before I go into the presentation, just really thank you for your time and thank you to uh, city administration and city manager and their office because this is six to eight months of really hard work on a decade old agreement and we basically did it um, together in a very collaborative method and I'm just, uh, it to me is a shining example of how organizations can come to work together on a very complex piece and come to something that actually really benefits the community. Um, really excited to be here because as, as you know, I've had the chance to meet many of you. Um, Edmonton's my hometown and I'm very proudly Edmontonian, but I haven't lived here for 20 years and I, I moved back here after careful consideration of where in the world to live and I really believe this is one of the best cities in the world to live. Super, super proud and um, what we contribute um, to the world as a city and also as a football team. So we've just put four or five slides together here. Uh, should we maybe go to the next slide? Um, I wanted to start off by giving you a quick overview of where the Edmonton Elks is today. We've had a storied history, very, very successful um, organization and um, f for the years and, and generally recognized as one of the most successful teams in the entire league. Uh, however, exacerbated by COVID and the last four years and the changing of, of the sport world and also we got very comfortable with our previous year's success. And um, we, we, the brand is strong. I would say that it would be hard pressed to find an Edmontonian that does not know what the brand of the Edmonton Elks is. But the relevancy of it and the brand started to take a hit over the last few years. Um, that with COVID meant that we ended up with an $18 million loss over the last four years. Um, and even when we had an entire canceled season in 2020, so there was no games played because of COVID, we still made sure that we met all of our city obligations and our operating costs. And as we look at what is this path forward and the turnaround plan that we've created to get us back to break even and being sustainable, uh, a big part of this was our partnership with the city and understanding how can we grow our revenues together? How can we be a valuable contributor to this, to, to the city? So I wanted to highlight a couple of things here. The economic impact, um, uh, in 2022 was over 26 million. And in general, we range from anywhere from 26 to 30 million every year. Since we've been at the Commonwealth Stadium as our home, 14 million people have passed through those gates. And we have over 462 full-time and part-time employees, but that excludes the F&B staff. Um, over the last decade, through our fundraising efforts, we've also contributed more than six and a half million dollars back to the community in cash. Um, and that goes back to the football ecosystem um, and various other charities. Uh, next slide, please. The next couple of slides just really talk about the areas of impact that we do as a community-owned team. In the CFL, there are three types of team ownership, corporate, private, and then community-owned. And this makes us a very unique team in our approach to business because where the businesses that are owned by corporations or private, clearly their mandate is profitability and, um, and dividends that they want to pay back to the ownership. With us, of course, we want to be sustainable, but a guiding principle is our contribution to the community. What do we want to be as community leaders and how do we make Edmonton better? Uh, I talk about this in the next few slides on diversity. We were the first team in Canada to do a, a broadcast in Cree. And this model that we started last year is now going to be a case study used across all the leagues of how do we train and how do we use this. So it applies not only to Cree, but all other languages. So we're creating this turnkey package um, that the league can use. We made our first game um, last year a fundraiser for Stand With Ukraine, where we raised $172,000 that we donated back to the community. This was the largest single donation from a sport team in this entire country. We're very proud to have been able to do this with the support of the city and the community um, for, um, for this particular cause. We partner for years with um, Winf uh, Winifred Stewart, of where we have, that's a great picture of Carmela 
um, and Craig there in our, in our office. We also do a fundraiser where uh, contributions go to Joey Moss and his, um, and his memorial fund. Next slide, please. Our community outreach. This is an area that we do a lot of work on and we're actually quite poor at bragging about it. And people have just assumed that we've done it, but we, we don't, we sort of wink in the dark is what I'd, I'd say. People know it, but I, I just wanna highlight a couple of things. We've raised over $600,000 for our Elks Women Dinner uh, since 2007. We started this Purolator Tackle Hunger Food Drive here with the Edmonton Elks and um, that drives uh, um, our players and um, staff to support the food bank. And this Pure Later Tackle Hunger is an initiative that is now done by every single team across the entire country. Uh, Santa's Anonymous, 630 Ched support. We launched a massive campaign that goes into the, into the schools with our players of how to end bullying. And this is an annual thing because it's one of those causes that you don't, it doesn't go away. We have to do ongoing education. So every year our players are part of a training and then we send them back into the schools. Uh, kids up front is to provide tickets to participants that maybe have obstacles preventing them from attending a game and we give them free tickets. Next slide, please. Community support. Uh, we, we do a lot, of, a lot of in this area and one of the big projects that we launched recently was something we call Project Two Million and we identified 20 organizations in the city and we give them $100,000 of marketing support to drive their fundraising initiative. So if you have a walkathon or a dinner and you want to promote it and drive more revenue, you can leverage the platform of the Edmonton Elks and all of our marketing, our social media, um, activities at the stadium, LED, and all of our marketing assets to help them reach their financial goals. Next slide, please. I just wanted to wrap up by touching on some of the new initiatives that, that we're working on. I think there's a lot of great work to, to um, encourage accessibility to the venue, both by public transport and by bikes. And this is an area that we continue to work with multiple bike organizations throughout the city. I take the LRT to work or ride my bike, so I'm a big proponent of, of, of this and how we can continue to grow this area. Um, we have worked really closely with the city administration and this is an, an area that I'm particularly excited about because I can take my global network in sports and look at it and say, how do we work together to make better use of our facility and so that we can have more money and more events coming? And this requires us to have a really close collaboration, both in our networks and our relationships, but also in our approach of who can we bring and invite to the city? You know, I, I talk about it all the time of, of um, this is a great city for, for events to come to. I'm very fortunate that my network around the world is other CEOs of other sport properties who I know would love to have the kind of support that we get from the city to host their world championship or their event here. So that is a really exciting area because we have the best stadium in this country. Like, we have facilities that have to be upgraded, but there is no way you can walk into our stadium and not be in awe. It's a 56,000 seater stadium, the biggest in the country. We have players that come here that have performed you know, um, their sport in major stadiums across America, and they come here and they're always impressed. And that's a great thing for us to leverage. Um, in our, in our lease agreement, one of the other things that we look to do in, in a creative way of how can we make more money together and for the city was we took the merchandise agreement and we said, how can we do this better? Well, the Edmonton Elks, we already have a merchandise warehouse and staff and, and, and experience at it. So we said, well, when we bring a Garth Brooks to, or any other major concert to the city, We'll help run the merchandise for you and we'll work with the promoter so fans can buy the merchandise in advance and they don't have to line up for 30 minutes and miss half of the concert because now they can pick it up at our store for the next month after that. So the promoter makes more money, the city makes more money as a percentage and we drive more traffic into our merchandise store. So we think that's a really kind of simple solution but we had to rethink how we've typically done things for the last, last decade.
Thank you. That's great. Thank you very much for that presentation. Councillor Knack, you selected this item. Please go ahead. Uh, thank you, uh, Councillor Principe, and thanks uh, very much for the presentation. Um, so uh, I didn't have a lot of questions. I'm actually really excited about this. Um, I wanted to ask you a little bit more about the new initiatives, uh, both from your perspective and I'm going to come to city administration, which is that uh, I love the new idea of how we can better provide a, a better experience for everyone. I think the idea you've referenced the Garth Brooks concert, that's a great example of how to be better at this. Um, you have a lot of experience, uh, you know, building essentially empires of entertainment uh, over your career. And, and what I guess I'm curious about is we know uh, this is a question I asked years ago and it's always stuck with me is I think we, I've been told if we get three major concert events a la Garth Brooks a year, that is usually allows us to come close to breaking even uh, on the operations of Commonwealth. Now, I don't know if those numbers are still accurate. We'll come back to that. I guess I wanted to ask you, how do you see yourself being able to help us attract more? We're doing, a good, we're doing good work. We're getting some good events. Are there things that you can do either through the lease agreement or just through regular working with the city staff on attracting more large scale events like that that aren't the football games? I'll start with you and then I'm going to go to city admin. So I'd love just your perspective. Thank you, sir. I think that's a fantastic question to ask. And um, in general, cities, not just Edmonton, but in general, cities around the world view activities in their facilities as an inbound opportunity. So they sort of wait for people to say, oh, I'd like to look at coming to you. I don't know why, you know, like for whatever reason. It's been a more of an inbound driven thing. I think that we have this really unique opportunity to pursue those opportunities proactively by putting it in front of them to show this is how great it, of, of a partnership that you can have by, by coming to the city of Edmonton. So, and, and the key thing here is not just concerts. Mm -hmm. Concerts, um, the, the world has shifted where previously, 10 years ago, a concert promoter would say, I want to go to 20 cities across Canada or 15 cities, whatever it might be. But they, that was when travel was cost prohibitive to go across the country with low cost carriers and everything, it makes it a little bit more accessible. And now promoters are looking at the business model and they say, where is the biggest stadium that I can go to and let me park there for three days and make mm -hmm. more money than we could? So that you saw that with Garth Brooks, yeah. you see that with several, uh, several other acts that are coming. So I think organically this happens with concerts. With sporting properties, there's a little bit of a blend of finding the kind of sport that is not overly taxing as in the resources, like if you want to hold a FIFA World Cup, or if you want to hold a, um, an Olympics or Commonwealth Games, these are things that require a lot of investment. But there are many other sports that could come here that um, are much more turnkey. And an example would be, we could hold the World Championship in Ultimate Frisbee. We could hold the World Championship in CrossFit. So these are things that uh, utilize our space to our advantage, but we have to go to them and say, these are the solutions that we're bringing. Um, with Roger and with Andre, we've talked a lot about this, of how can I be the ambassador to, to go across the world and, and showcase this, and we're already doing it. And uh, I think that this, our lease is really such an example of the exception of a great partnership because other cities don't see this. Great, and then maybe to, to city administration, uh, uh, that same sort of question, I'm wondering how we can, I, I know we've got a great civic events team, we've got great staff, but they are, they do a million different things. Uh, and I know they can't do everything all the time. We have somebody who has built that up. Does the lease agreement allow us to try to be even more proactive in the traction of events working together with the Elks to, to bring in these type of big scale events? Yeah, Councillor, absolutely, it was one of the, the early conversations we had was about how do we maximize revenues and not only attracting the events, so we do have our event attraction team that works mm -hmm. and you know, the Sport Council has given us advice on the sport events to go after, the partnership with Explore Edmonton on, on bringing events to the city. Uh, but the team has also been really generous in adjusting their schedule and planning their season around events so that we can, if we know we can bring something in at a certain time, uh, the team even moved some of their games and you know, with another team they sort of swapped home dates. Uh, to allow us to bring an event in. So it is very collaborative. We could always work together more. If new opportunities come from the team, we would absolutely pursue them. So it, I guess that's the big question is that is there is there opportunity that if they proactively wanted to go out uh, because of the network that has been formed in the past to go and attract some of those events, 
can they do that in partnership with the city in a way that allows us to, to try to bring in even more and more. Yeah, absolutely. We, we partner with all kinds of organizations to bring in, whether it's the big air snowboard event or yeah. Rugby Sevens. Um, you know, we, we're constantly working with sport organizations, so it would be no different with the Elks. And, you know, as we share the stadium and you know, share concession revenues and advertising revenues, you know, there's other opportunities there to, to increase those revenues that we would absolutely want to work together, need to work together to maximize those. Okay, I'm out of time. Thank you. Thank you. Mayor Sohi. Thank you, uh, uh, Chair Principe. Uh, uh, when time comes, I would like to move the recommendation. Uh, uh, the First of all, Victor, uh, uh, thank you so much for moving back home. Uh, you know, it's uh, uh, you are such a great champion. Uh, I want to come back to your observation that uh, Elks have a strong brand, which is absolutely true, right? And it is relevant to some people, but how do we make it relevant to as of a demographics change? I just want to get some, some of your ideas around, uh, uh, you know, exciting people about it and getting more people back into, uh, into the stadium and embracing the, uh, uh, the game. Thank you, Mayor. This is, for obvious reasons, um, uh, an initiative that's very close to my heart, I would say. I, I recognize in the league, among the leadership, I am the exception, both in terms of visible minority and just my, my experience, and finding, and finding creative ways and new ways to make sure that our community-owned club reflects the diversity of our city is a deeply personal issue for me, but also for the organization of what we, what we strive for. Um, on a gender basis, our organization is almost 50% female male. We're the only club in the entire league that is like that. Our number two person in the company, our CFO, is Miss Vanessa Potter. There's no other team that has that. And this is something that, you know, maybe happened organically, but it's something that we should be, we're very proud of. It, to your point about reaching out to different communities, um, to me, this is not just hey, we have a football game, come watch football. You, ha you have to give a value proposition back to the communities and say, how can we work together? What does this help your community? We've got some great new initiatives that we're looking at to work with various cultural organizations that is about helping them drive their mandate, their message out to our fans, as opposed to the traditional I'd say a, a simplistic of approach saying, hey, you got to come and buy a ticket. To me, that's not what it's about. We, we, if we show value back to the community, they'll, they'll come back and support us. We saw that with our Project 2 Million. We, when we gave back to the city, those organizations supported us in a big way. United Way was an excellent example where they brought something like 50,000 people. I mean, you're at the event uh, to, you know, to support it. So... We know that these initiatives work um, by, by giving first. No, I, I thank you for that. In, in any way we can assist in that, please uh, never hesitate to uh, give us a call, right? Because uh, uh, Elks are absolutely integral to uh, Edmonton and our community and want to make sure that they, uh, as our community's demographics change, that they continue to be uh, uh, as, 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 as as proud and as, uh, you know, uh, uh, so no, thank you for that. So coming to the agreement, uh, how do you think the, some of the changes being proposed uh, on some of the levies and all that enable you to kind of get back into that s situation that you were before COVID or even like, how would these changes help you? How would the lease specifically help yeah. us? Yeah. Um, uh, we've put together a very extensive, what I'd call, turnaround plan in recognizing that my urgency that I, I, we put forward to our, our board and that our board was supportive of was that we cannot continue to do what we've done in the past. Mm. This is a time that we have to change. Internally, we made extensive budget cuts, very, very painful, and this is probably the first time in many years that we made this level of cuts, both in football and in operations. But the other part of the, of the scenario is finding out areas where we can be more efficient 
in our expenses. This is where the partnership with, with, um, with Roger and Heather and their team of how we work together uh, in the lease. You know, it's a, it's a decade old lease that we had to really look at it line by line and, and understand what are we doing inefficiently, like the merchandise one is an example. Um, this year we'll have the food and beverage coming up for an RFP, for a renewal. So we've already started to work very closely at that together, as opposed to just renewing the same partner or looking at it, we're really saying, how does, how does this work that we're putting into it from the lease and with the concession make a future that is better for a fan experience and, and then maybe have them invest into some assets in the stadium? Thank you. Great, thank you, Mayor Sohi. Councillor Rice. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. So, I just want to start saying, uh, I was a very active athlete when I was younger. I'm still young right now. <laughs> but I was younger, I played lots of games and then participated in lots of sports. And I really understand how important and for uh, people and even for ourselves to have some exciting men's games and going around in the city. So thank you for the uh, presentation. That's, that's, that's a very good presentation. Um, I have a few questions here and then to, uh, to Victor and to Mr. Tree. Uh, so I, I think I pronounced your last name <laughs> right. That's Chinese for us name. And also uh, administration, the first one, and specifically you talk about some economic, uh, significant economic impact. Um, and then you gave some like amount, the quantitative data, and for the dollar amount. Um, um, is that dollar amount is only measure for the economic impact, or do you have a specific the target and the measure, and how we see that e economic impact in place. If I understand the question correctly, mm -hmm. you're asking about the process that we went through to determine the economic impact number. So we worked with Explore Edmonton, and Heather is actually who helped connect me, um, and we they have a uh, formula that they use to calculate the economic impact for a event that comes to the city. So we just, we gave them all of our information um, and uh, and we put, they put that into their black box of machinery oh, <laughs> and then okay. got the economic impact. But yeah. it's not, uh, it's not uh, overlapped uh, with the different events, just a specific unique. That's event right. And, it's only and the, you provide. It. That's right. It's only the Edmonton okay. Elks. So every we have ten home games um, a season, as an example. And every time we hold a game, an opposing team brings their entire team and their fans to hear. If we play against Saskatchewan, we know we have a lot of people that drive over, and that's one of our most highly attended games. Okay. Uh, thank you. Uh, so my next question could be administration or could be you and both can respond. Do you or have the Edmonton Elks contributed to any of the upgraded required of come well stadium? Uh, uh, stat, stat, I hope I pronounce that word. Sta stadium. And some particular items and for upgrades and appeal and request in the budget. So the football team has in the past contributed to the capital upgrades at the stadium, uh, both the LED stadium. ring um, that um, is now in place for about five or six years. That was about $3 million that the team contributed to that a significant upgrade to the fan experience at the stadium. Also the football team has contributed to the development of the Commonwealth uh, Community Recreation Center Fieldhouse. The football team also contributed $3 million to that. Um, to the development of that field house at the recreation center, and both the community and the football team have access to that okay. facility as well. So that is for the past contribution, and yes. do we have any planned future contribution and for the next four years budget? So right now the stadium um, is um, aligned with a um, major rehabilitation project that has been funded already at about $25 million. Um, right now that's fully city funded. 
we're always looking for opportunities for the football team to be able to participate with the capital upgrades. Right now we're focused on the rehab and then I'll be looking for future partners that will be able to contribute to the capital upgrades at the stadium that is planned. As planned, but we don't have details yeah. yet. Not details because right now. Yeah. Previously we had a ticket tax. We replaced all the seats at the stadium based on the ticket tax. So each of the Elks fan when they came in there was a surcharge on their tickets. That, that's paid off now, we've covered the cost of that project, but it is something that we are jointly talking about doing in the future uh, when, when circumstances are a little bit different. Okay, so I, I, I think I still have a few, few questions, but last uh, here for this round. And then regarding the concession amounts, like how much on average is sold per game? I don't have that number offhand, but I can I can come back to you on it. Okay. Yeah. yeah we'll come back for the next question. Okay. Great. Thank you, Councillor Rice. I think I see your CFO working on her laptop, so <laughs> I think we'll get the answer shortly. Councillor Stevenson. Uh, he had his round on. Great. Um, thank you so much. Uh, you know, first of all, it is so wonderful to be speaking to you as the Edmonton Elks. I uh, just want to to take a moment to publicly. Thank you for that that name change and, and the um, commitment it shows towards creating a more inclusive community and, and towards our work on reconciliation. So very exciting uh, on that. Um, you know, I was really excited about the, the merchandise plan and I, I noticed it's not included in this agreement. So this agreement is only for Elks games, is that correct? And then the merchandise uh, work would potentially be outside of this agreement? Yeah, currently our, the vendor in the stadium that does the food and beverage is doing the merchandising, so that agreement's up at the end of this year, so gotcha. as we negotiate a new agreement, that'll be the opportunity to look at how we do that work. Okay, perfect, yeah, and I really like that idea of proactively, uh, you know, thinking strategically about concession and merchandising and how we move that forward. Um, also, you know, just to that, that point, uh, Mr. Jebney, that you just made, so, you know, I understand this is a five-year agreement, the previous one was 10 years, I think, um, so my assumption is that the five years is just recognizing that we're sort of in a, in a, in a difficult position. We don't know how everything will sort of shift post pandemic. Um, so the five year timeline gives us a chance to reconsider in five years when we have a better idea of, of what recovery looks like. Yeah, that's right. At the, at the start, we said, you know, we, we could do a 40 year agreement. We see the team being here as a tenant in the stadium. Uh, but we, we didn't recognize the circumstances that they're under now and thought a shorter term that we could then renegotiate, uh, in the five years made sense. Perfect. Um, you know, I, I think it makes a lot of sense for the Elks um, $100,000 contribution for the free ticket to ride to be focused on advertising because ultimately that will increase um, attendance, which increases our revenues. So, so that makes sense overall. Just wondering from an admin's perspective, though, just wondering what strategies we're taking to capture revenue from those uh, who are doing park and ride uh, to and from the stadium on, on game days and, and for other events as well. I don't know if someone from ETS is there. Uh, happy to follow that up offline. Yeah, different well. for the Elks games. It's certainly the it's included in the in the ticket. You get the free tra transportation to and from the game. For other events at the stadium, the, the individual users would pay those costs to take the park and ride. Okay, so there's still there still yeah. is a, a ticket surcharge for ETS. Um, the free ticket to ride, hundred thousand dollar contribution was. Yeah, that was that was a contribution previously that helped offset those costs. Uh, so that was free for as folks added the game ticket to get on, on the train or on the park and ride. Uh, so we're recommending waiving that for two years and focus that on marketing, increasing attendance at the games. For other events at the stadium, the individual users of park and ride would pay that fee out of their pocket. Gotcha. Actually, okay, sorry, I'm not sure I totally. So, so 100,000K, the free ticket to ride, that's part of the 200K that's being waived for the next two years or that's an additional thing that's being waived? Yeah, in addition, the 200,000 is okay. the license to use the space in the stadium, the offices, the locker rooms, that sort of thing. And then there was the $100,000 contribution to the park and ride, or to the, the ride transit program. Okay, but individual ticket users are still gonna be paying a ticket surcharge to be using, to have transit included in their ticket. It'll still be free, the, the Elks won't be paying that additional fee to us for the first two years of the agreement. Okay, okay, so then I think I think going back to my original question then, just in terms of how, how we as a city are maybe looking to capture some of that, that um, just recognizing that game days are a, a huge, huge opportunity for, uh, or we see a huge number of people using transit. Um, so just wondering how we, we capture that as part of our transit revenue. Uh, hi, Councillor, I can provide some support. So 
Uh, for the else games, the offset as Roger described was coming from that 100,000 uh, to assist. So in the absence of that, we essentially wouldn't have uh, revenue recognition coming in uh, because it's a show your, your pass, your ticket. Um, in order to use it for regular special event services, we have uh, lots of tracking that takes place in terms of the revenue recognition. And that goes in uh, as part of our reporting on the financials, uh, just through regular kind of processes that we have. Um, but we would have monitoring through, now that we're introducing ARC, we'll have ARC fare payment, plus we have our regular kind of fairing um, and our park and ride fee uh, for people for non-ELKS events. Okay. Okay. No, that's interesting. I mean, again, I think I think I, I understand the logic of not putting it on the Elks organization itself for the hundred thousand. But again, thinking of um, potential ticket surcharges in the future. But I, I should also recognize that we do get a ticket surcharge generally that goes into our general revenue, which again can help support ETS. Yeah, and currently this part of the agreement is for each ticket that's redeemed, we get a, a fee, and that that number goes up over the over the life of the agreement. Great. Great. Thank you so much. No further questions. Thank you, Cal Councillor Stevenson. Councillor Salvador. Thanks so much. Um, and thanks so much for the, the excellent presentation. Um, yeah, just a, a few additional questions. Uh, so curious about, you know, are there any, any opportunities on the horizon for um, activating some of the space around the stadium, sort of on the on the periphery, um, just trying to think about, yeah, how to how to create that really really special experience for people who are are coming to events, um, not just within the stadium itself, but uh, sort of the connectivity around. Uh, thank you, Councillor Salvador. Uh, this is these plans are separate from the lease, but one of the things that we're working on is we've reached out to over a hundred organizations in the city uh, and we've gotten very positive response from quite a number of them and the initiative is to take the space that would typically be called our fan zone which is on the sidewalk area on the east side of the stadium be between Stadium Road and the LRT so if you come off the LRT cross Stadium Road onto that area and to give them and work with different communities uh, um, to access that space to promote their own um, uh, their own association or their own cultural initiatives or, or local businesses. So that one we're still working on and I think it'd be an exciting um, reimagination of how we use that space as to activate our, our community partners. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, well, thanks for that. And I think it, it speaks to um, just the community centric approach that that the Elks are taking and I, I really appreciate that. Um, and I should say, uh, I think that the, the plans that are in the works um, to get the, the Elks to a sustainable place uh, make a lot of sense. You know, the merchandise plan in particular, um, I think is excellent. Uh, also great to see some partnerships with uh, some, some local bike and active transportation organizations so that folks have um, options for getting to, um, getting to games and events. And then maybe just to, to, to further, further ask some questions around Councillor Stevenson's line of questioning, uh, about the, the the free ticket to ride, I guess I'm just wondering um, to to administration um, what I guess what immediate impacts would that have on ETS's budget then? Just trying to trying to understand what that would look like. Yeah. So what's being described is that for the two years there wouldn't be a hundred thousand uh, contribution to our transit related revenues. Uh, so within our branch budget, we have kind of our revenues that we collect and then our expenditures. Um, so it's saying that for the two years, the $100,000 wouldn't uh, be directed in that manner. And instead, I think it outlined the opportunity to kind of look at taking those monies on the Elks uh, side and focusing it more on efforts to increase ridership um, and support for the Elks uh, attendance. Okay, okay. Um, and then... So if the efforts are to basically redirect those funds uh, to get more folks coming to the game, do we expect a uh, a substantial increase on the other side of that equation? So more folks are coming to the game and we're seeing that increased revenue just in a different form. Um, what are the expectations around that? Yeah, so we, Go ahead, Roger. 
With, within the stadium budget, there is also a transfer of, from operating costs to cover some of the transit expenses. So that's also built into the agreement. So we know that there's a fee that we transfer over to, to transit to help cover the costs of the park and ride to the games. So the 100000 was the additional piece from the Elks uh, in this program. Okay, okay. I think that helps. Um, so it's not like this would have knock-on effects uh, in, in other realms for ETS, would it? So I think it's just important what Roger's describing as the expenditure side. So we spend almost 900,000 on our support uh, around park and rides and whatnot. Um, and then it's the revenue side that would just see that change for the two years uh, of the 100,000. So there's kind of the two, two sets of um, kind of finances to consider. And, you know, through increasing the number of people using transit by showing their ticket, you know, I think it's safe to say there may be some knockoff impacts of people who otherwise wouldn't be using transit and maybe that encourages them to consider using it a bit more outside of special events um but i don't have any data in terms of measuring that right okay um well i think that that helps me in my in my understanding of it um yeah and i think it 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 does make sense, at least in the in the interim, to move forward with this approach, uh, to to really focus on um, on that advertising piece to get people to to attend. Um, and then, just an unrelated. I, I'm question. sorry, Councillor Salvador, oh. your time is up. Oh, you can come sorry. for another round. Okay. There's going to be another round, so come come again. Uh, Councillor Tang. Great, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, yeah, so thank you very much for this presentation. Um, you know, I am a fan of the Elks, my family is, uh, and I really appreciate, you know, Victor, the leadership and the vision you bring to this. Um, and, uh, you know, as I, as you know, I've been following some of the community um, involvement um, from, you know, just, uh, but I, I, uh, just having you, you know, really articulate some of that through the presentation kind of really demonstrate the scope um, and, you know, just different diverse communities that, that the team has been reaching. And I love that notion of how you talked about the community ownership. Um, so I guess just to, to just a quick follow on to Ms. Hunt McDonald around the, the transit trends. Um, what has the, the ridership been like for the last uh, few years to the games? Do we so have that data? We do, yeah. So we move about 50% of the attendees, which is um, wow. consistent with a lot of the other bigger events as well. Uh, we typically have pretty good support. Um, and I mean, obviously, I'm always interested in increasing more transit usage, um, but I'm, I'm quite happy with uh, seeing that we're moving about half. And that is that is that 50% consistent? Yeah, so the last few years, exactly. So it hovers between about 46% and 53% thereabouts. Mm -hmm. um, but on average, and again, looking outside, not just for the Elks games, uh, you know, getting that kind of 50% average. Gotcha. Great. Thank you so much. Um, uh, I, and I guess uh, just maybe back to either Roger or Victor for the um, the license agreement and, and the dollar figures listed in the report. Is that is that the same as it's been in previous years? The license, the yeah. yeah, the five million over the term. Yeah, so license the license fee is consistent. Um, how it's been, uh, it raises every year based on the CPI, and yeah. um, based on the usage of the football team, um, and the admission surcharge has gone up uh, based on the attendance thresholds. Uh, so gotcha. there are some um, increases over the course of the term, as well as in the previous ten year agreement as well. Gotcha. Thank you um, for that clarification. And then uh, wondering for, for projects like the Project 2 Million, um, I think that was for 2022, 2023, will this be continuing? Absolutely. Thank you. <laughs> um, and then I guess lastly, you know, I, I, I assume that, you know, you do have a broader action plan that includes actions like, you know, the discussion today and the actions like the merchandise. But I'm wondering if you're able to share um, if there's other kind of ideas and actions you're working on in addition to merchandise um, and the licensing agreement to bring the organization back on a stable financial footing, whether or not they directly implicate the city. 
Yeah, there, there's quite a lot. I, I think I'll maybe just start with one really big example is we have revamped our entire pricing structure, which has not, which has not been changed since 2003. This is the first time that we've changed our ticketing structure since 2003. And the goal that we approached it was, how do we make our event an affordable family activity? How do we make it that, you know, we, we understand the challenges that, that Edmontonians are facing, and this we want this to be an option for them. We understand other pro, pro teams have a different philosophy of what they want to charge, but we look at this as a night to bring the family together. And so we've made... Our cheapest ticket now is $15 per person, and if you have a child under 12, you get in free. So basically, you can bring your whole family, if you have two kids under 12 and two parents, for a night out for $30. Well, no, that's that's excellent to hear, and I, I really appreciate that, you know, thinking and that approach to, to you know, the various policies that you, that you do have. Um, you know, I'm looking forward to... Uh, to, to see what other um, ideas and actions will emerge. Um, and uh, yeah, go Elks. Thank you, Councillor Tang. That's right, go Elks. Uh, Mayor Soli. Thank you. Uh, that's, you know, kids under 12 are free uh, to watch games and 12 uh, kids under 12 also get to ride free transit, right? So they're kind of aligns, which is good, you know. Uh, 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 on ETS related, my questions are answered, uh, but I just want to follow up on the uh, some of the uh, uh, procurement for food and beverage, for local procurement, because uh, we hear often from local vendors that they don't have access to city-owned facilities. Um, so that is not a part of the agreement, right? But how do we, I just want to get your thoughts on maybe Victor's thoughts and uh, and uh, administration's thoughts. Like, how do we make it sh make sure that there's, if there are ex exclusivity agreements, I don't know if there are on this on this side. How do we open it up for local? Uh, uh, yeah, I can I can speak to ours and I'll let Victor speak to their arrangements. The Elks do have some exclusive arrangements on game day, uh, and we have some as well throughout the year. But there's also many. Um, I know the beer, local beer sponsorship came up in a previous report and any other event at the stadium that isn't an Elks game, they have a, they have a sponsor in that category, but others, other providers can come into other events that we host. So it's not an exclusivity for the whole stadium, it's just for the Elks games. Okay, so Victor, on, on exclusivity agreements and how do you make sure that local procurement and local business are able to sell their beer or food or whatever? Exclusivity is one, one factor that we consider. Obviously, if someone pays for that, then there's the economic side of the equation. But I would say, as a guiding principle, we're trying to do first business with local businesses okay. and showcase that wherever we can. Okay. Well, that, that's good to know, and uh, maybe we can follow up off, uh, offside on, on some of that, that work, right? So that's, that's, that's good. So, uh, uh, so that's about... I have for the question. I'm really excited about that community outreach. Looking forward to maybe attending some of those cultural community ex exhibitions outside of the stadiums, and when you are ready to do, ready to do that. Right? No, so that's about it. Uh, so, clerk, uh, sorry, uh, Chair Prince Bay, whenever you want me to move, I can move the recommendation. Okay, you want me to do it? I think you can move it now. Yes. Okay. All right. So I will. Okay, I will move that the license agreement between the City of Edmonton and the Edmonton Eskimo Football Club operating as Edmonton Elks Football Club, as outlined in Attachment 1 of the February 27, 2023 Community Services Report CS01599 be approved, and that the agreement be in form and content acceptable to the city manager. Great, thank you, Mayor Sohi. Councillor Rice. Uh, thank you, uh, Chair Principe. Uh, this is the recommendation to council, right? Is our level approval? Okay, okay, good. Uh, I would like to follow the Mayor Sohi's comment on the local support local business. I do think that is very important, and specifically, and um, I think a few weeks ago we we learned about for the Expo Edmonton we have twenty percent, twenty five percent. Did I get that 
percentage rate. 25% of the procurement and it will support the local beer industrial and for the drinks uh, like that. So do you have a specific percentage for that? Or to, the, for, to be transparent? Yeah. Got it. Sorry, I had to ask for clarification. I didn't understand what the 25% was. Yeah. Um, I, I, I think where we are right now, we have some existing agreements that are provide exclusivity. Mm -hmm. I'd say that philosophically, that's not what we would um, start with in the future. And many brands are understanding that exclusivity is not necessarily part of their deal anymore. As I'd mentioned earlier, it is a number one priority for organization to showcase local businesses. Uh, that's great, and then I do think that is really important for our local uh, beer industry yeah. to be heard. Uh, not just for that. not just yeah. beer. I would say all local businesses w it would be our approach. Yeah, with like yeah. food, with other type right. of things. Yes. Uh, so the next question to specific to administration. Uh, I know the calculation from Explore Edmonton and, and to calculate in economic impact. And then do we have specific measures, how we measure that impact already achieved or not? Yeah, we rely on Explore Edmonton to do those calculations, but they've done them not only for the Elks games, but for the other events that we've hosted in the stadium. So we can aggregate that to get the total economic impact of events held in Commonwealth Stadium. Yeah, uh, I, I think that my, this is gen, general question is not only to, to your case, and because we, we get all the numbers for the uh, measures, but we don't know at the end, and if we achieve that goal or not. So I do expect to see and how we measure that to achieve or not. Yeah, it's, it, it's really driven by attendance and the number of out-of-town attendees, hotel rooms, the spending in the city. So different events will have a different economic impact, even though one may have a, a really high local population or participation, uh, and the economic impact may not be as great, but it may be really important to us for other reasons. We do calculate the economic impact of the events at the stadium. Okay, so I may uh, want to follow up on that um, offline. And a specific another one, I, I want to go back to $25 million and for the next four years and the capital and the city fully funded updates. Uh, by looking at the investment return uh, from this agreement, we have 40% of average revenue, uh, advertising revenue, and then 40% and other 5% five, 5 of first $3 million of concession and then 7% of a month over $3 million. So do you have the data for my first question about the uh, average, how much on average is sold per game? Our gross sales for last year over 10 games was 2.647 million. Because I tried to do some like the calculation and to see how much contribution and for that $25 million we could. Uh, okay, thank you for that information. I think that's all question and from me. And then, so I'm ready to speak. Thank you, Councillor Rice. Councillor Salvador? Yeah, thank you. Um, just two remaining questions. Uh, so just to, to administration, wondering if we've done uh, sort of similar waivers of license fees in the past? No, we, we had some discussions during the pandemic and with some of the federal relief programs, the team was able to access funding during that time. So this would be the first time. Okay, thanks. Yeah, and um, no, that, that makes sense to me. Uh, and then just a final one. I know uh, when it comes to the renewal of Commonwealth Stadium, um, uh, I know we, in, we included that as a, a provincial ask. Um, just wondering if there's any opportunities for some joint advocacy um, around the renewal of the stadium. I think certainly I'll, I'll let Victor jump in, but I think together we're both interested and in, invested in seeing the stadium uh, be, be remain relevant, provide good experiences for Edmontonians. Uh, so I think it's not just a football club, but it's Explore Edmonton and others that we'd want to work together to really show the, the benefits of having a, a modern and, and functioning stadium.
<laughs> I'm sorry, um, to, to Victor, I think you're, you're there as well. Yeah. Sorry, I, th I thought his answer was excellent already. So, Agreed. Uh, um, uh, I think that a really recent example that I can point to is the kind of close collaboration that we had during the FIFA bid, which was a very, very complex piece. And the football club, we looked at how we would adjust our schedule, move our team to practice outside of the stadium, and we really worked closely to try and make that happen. Unfortunately, substandard cities beat us, but you know, this is how it is. Well, I, I appreciate that um, and, and agree. You know, there's really fantastic partners around the table, um, all pushing in the same direction. So uh, that's it for me. Uh, very supportive. Thanks. Thank you, Councillor Salvador. Are there any more questions to administration? I know Councillor Rice is on the board to speak to the motion on the floor. No more questions. Councillor Rice, we'll go to you. Uh, thank you. I would like to say I love attending Edmund Elks games uh, with my family. So even I, ha I have my family members and I love to play football. <laughs> so they are an affordable and fun way to spend the day. And I hope this agreement will bring um, prosperity back and to the club and because you lost like $80 million in the past four years. <laughs> and the specific following the COVID-19 pandemic. I also am lo looking forward uh, to see that increased support for our local business, and, uh, including our local like bio industrial uh, area. And then because they, they did express their concern and how there could be more participant into our local event and happened in Edmonton. So I'm so glad to heard that. And then this is uh, the priority to support, support our local business. And because support local business will actually support our cities, our local economy and recovery and growth. So very happy to, uh, to heard that. Um, and also, and then I looking forward for the new initiatives and you mentioned for 2023. And then even though right now you may not have the details and for some uh, plan, uh, but looking forward to, to see more events you attract to our city and because of more events and more revenue for our city as well. Uh, so I want to recognize all the hard work the Elf Community Fund Foundation does and also I'm, I'm grateful and for the clubs and all the participants uh, athletes and also managers, administration, and the volunteers. So I'm going to support uh, this agreement. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Rice. Anyone else to speak to it before I go to Mayor Sohi to close? No, nope, you're up, Mayor Sohi. Yeah, thank you. I uh, want to start by uh, thanking our administration and the Elks uh, team for working together on coming up with this uh, new lease agreement, I think makes sense and the, uh, hopefully allow Elks to uh, expand their community outreach and recover some of the, uh, or come out of the, some of the challenges that have been, uh, uh, been faced by the organization. Some are related to pandemic uh, and some are related to, uh, uh, you know, other structural issues and I am so optimistic that uh, under Victor's leadership, uh, that the uh, that the, this such a phenomenal integral part of our community, uh, uh, which elks are, uh, and that we'll be able to uh, uh, expand and uh, get uh, get the fan base growing, get uh, more events, uh, 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 attraction of more events, uh, and uh, and the huge impact of twenty six million dollars will grow uh, as uh, as the uh, as the events. Uh, events grow. So I'm really, really hopeful that uh, this will work for you uh, and uh, uh, look forward to supporting you whichever way we can, Victor. Uh, and uh, so good luck to, uh, to you and your, uh, and your team. Uh, uh, and uh, the, uh, I, I look forward to actually some of those activities that you're going to create around the, around the periphery of the, of the stadium. Uh, it's a uh, stadium is a, uh, this is a landmark building for our city, uh, and uh, 
uh, it's a phenomenal place whenever I go there. You know, I, uh, I do get that excitement because of just uh, some seeing people and, uh, and, the, and, the, and the, the sense of community that you get there when you walk into that place. It's so phenomenal, right? So I think uh, uh, it, it, we want to build on that, and I am fully confident you will be able to, uh, able to, uh, able to do so. So look forward to, uh, to this, and I hope uh, that committee will approve this, uh, and uh, wish you all the best. Thank you, Mayor Sogi. Please vote. We have five votes. Please display the vote. And that has carried. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. All right, so next, responses to councillor inquiries, none. Private reports, none. Motions pending, none. Notices of motion and motions without customary notice. Madam Chair, I don't have any, but I would like to say a job well done. Oh, thank you, Councillor Paquette. I appreciate that. And go Elks. <laughs> and drink responsibly. <laughs> yes, thank you all that wonderful public announcement. And we are adjourned, thank you. And thank you.